Chapter five of the Think Python textbook is on conditionals and recursion. It goes through floor division and modulus, the Boolean expression, logical operators, conditional execution, alternative execution, chain conditionals, nested conditionals, recursion, and infinite recursion, as well as keyboard input. So it starts off with conditionals and recursions, or if statements, ways of executing code depending on a state of a program. Almost all of your code that you're going to be writing, you're going to want to use different pieces of a program depending on a particular situation. Now, the book goes through the floor division operator. That's the one that shows two slashes. It divides two numbers and rounds down to an integer. Let's suppose you have a movie with a runtime of 105 minutes and you want to know how long that is in hours. You could use conventional division that returns a floating point. So here, in this code, we're going to set minutes equal to 105, or 105 minutes. When I take my variable minutes that I assign the value of 105 and divide that by 60, I get 1.75. Does it make sense to talk about hours in terms of 1.75? No. We generally talk about one hour and however many minutes, if it's less than two hours. And that's, so that's not how we would normally write hours out. That's why we want to make use of floor division. So floor division returns the integer number of hours and it rounds down. So if we set hours equal to, so we're assigning to hours the value minutes using floor division, dividing by 60, what do we get? Well, let's find out. We get one for one hour. So out of 105, we have one whole hour. How do we determine what's left? We can use the modulus op operator, and that will divide the two numbers and return what's remaining. So the remainder after we've done our, you know, pulled out our first hour, we can find in this way, run remainder, set it equal to minutes, and modulus operator, 60. So if we run that code, we find that remainder is 45. So we end up with one hour and 45 minutes. Now let's go ahead and create a nice little function that will convert movie times from minutes to hours and minutes. So here it is, all written up, DEF, movie time, we're going to have an argument parameter of minutes, and it's going to take our minutes, and it's going to convert it into hours and minutes, and then it's going to print it out. So here's a string, print out string of hours because we want to print out whatever the result of the mo of the floor division is but we want it to show up as part of a print statement so we're printing it out as a string we're printing out the string hrs to show that that's however many hours and then we're going to take the modulus mins and we're going to print that out as a string and we're going to add to that mins so if we create this function movie time and then we pass the argument of 105 so movie time we're going to put in our 105 minutes we get one hour and 45 minutes just as we did when we set, calculated that separately before this chapter also goes over boolean expressions now boolean expression remember is an expression that is either true or false following examples we're using the operator equals equals remember is what you use for equals in python since the equal sign alone is used as an assignment 
So we're using equals equals to compare two operands and produce true if they are equal and false otherwise. So what should we get from five equal to five? Is that true or false? True, obviously. Five equal to six should produce false, yes, and it does. So what is the type of true? It's a bool. What do you think the type of false is? Also a bool. So we have some other operators that we can use here. Here is our relational operator and what it is does. So x with an exclamation point and equal sign y. It's going to be x is not equal to y. We have x is greater than y. x is less than y. x is greater than or equal to y. x is less than or equal to y. These are all Boolean operators. Next, we have logical operators. So we have three logical operators, and, or, and not. Very similar is their meaning to English. So here's an example. If x is greater than 0 and x is less than 10, it, that would generate a true. If x is between 0 and 10, it would return true. Let's try it here. So x, or in this case, 5 greater than 0 and 5 is less than 10. Both of these logical tests have to be true before it will return a true. 5 is greater than 0 and 5 is also less than 10, so that should return true, yes? Yes. What about this one? 20 greater than 0, yes. And 20 less than 10? No. So what should that give us? That should give us false. Now let's look at logical operator or using the modulus operator. So here we have for modulus operator 2 equal to 0 or for modulus operator 3 equal to 0. This translates to 4 divided by 2's remainder is equal to 0 or 4 divided by 3's remainder is equal to 0. If either of those is true, it should be true. Now in this case, 4 divided by 2 has no remainder, so it's 0. So that first statement is true. That in and of itself makes this true. If you were to test the second one, 4 divided by 3 does not equal zero because there is a remainder of one. So that one would be false, but because the first one was true, it would be okay. It would still be a true statement. What about nine divided by two's remainder? That would be what? One, and that is not equal to zero. So let's look at nine divided by three's remainder is zero, so that second statement is true, so this one should be true, yes? And in fact it is. Now, what about this one? We have nine divided by two, so remainder being one, so that one is not true, it's not equal to zero, or 10 divided by three's remainder, being equal to zero, but 10 divided by three leaves a remainder of one, so that one is also not true. So we have two false statements. So what should we get? False, of course. You also have the not operator, which will negate a Boolean expression. So if you have not x greater than y is true, then x greater than y's value must be false. So let's take a look here. We have not in front of the expression 10 greater than 5. 10 is in fact greater than 5, so not 10 greater than 5 should give us what? False, because the value of 10 greater than 5 is true. And to test that, let's run this code right here. And we see that that is the case. So it's simply reversing the condition. Next, we'll look at conditional execution. In order to write useful programs, we almost always need the ability to check conditions because the program needs to change behavior accordingly. 
So conditional statements give us this ability. Here's one of the simplest forms of if. If you have a variable called x, set it equal to 10. If x is greater than zero, then print out x is positive. If we run this, what should we get? Well, we should get x is positive because x is currently equal to 10, and it is a positive number. So the Boolean expression after the if is called the condition. That would be this right here. That's our Boolean expression, and it is our condition. So x greater than 0 is the condition. If that is true, then, some, then whatever comes after gets run. Next, let's look at alternative execution. A second form of the if statement is alternative execution in which there are two possibilities and the condition determines which one runs. These alternatives are called branches because they are the branches of the flow of execution. So let's take a look again. Here we are, we've got our variable x, we've set it equal to 10. If the remainder of x divided by two is equal to zero, print x is even. If that's not true, else print x is odd. So let's see what happens. x is even because 10 divided by 2 is 5 with no remainder. That would be a remainder of 0 equal to 0. So therefore, it's an even number. Let's try this same code with x equal to 9, and it should show up as an odd. x is odd. So we had two branches that could happen, this or this. We also have chained conditionals, because sometimes there are more than two variables and we need more than two branches. We can use else if here, or ELIF, the abbreviation for else if. In this example, exactly one branch will run. There is no limit to the number of ELIF statements you can have. If there is an else clause, it has to be at the end, but there doesn't have to be one. So you could do a series after your if of ELIFs and not use the else at all. However, if you choose to use else, make sure it's the last one, otherwise it will cause you a problem. So here's an example of a chained conditional. We have x equal to 10, y equal to 11. If x is less than y, print out x is less than y. Else if, if x is greater than y, print x is greater than y. Else, print x and y are equal. Because we don't have to check for another condition on our else because we know there's only one other option. It's equal. So let's test our code and see if this runs. x is 10, y is 11, so 10 is less than y or 11, so we get that statement printed out. Let's change the values of our variables. Here we have x is 12, y is 11, and see what happens. And x is greater than y, or 12 is greater than 11. Here we've set them to be equal, so we should get the third branch printed out. X and Y are equal. All right, let's look next at nested conditionals. This is one conditional that can be nested within another. So the outer condition will contain two branches. The first branch is a simple statement. The second branch contains another if statement, which has two branches of its own. Those branches are both simple statements, but although they could have more conditional statements as well. So here we're redoing our little x and y example, but we're changing it a little bit. So we have x equal to 12, y equal to 12. If x equals y print, x and y are equal. Else, check and see, if x is less than y, so print, x is less than y, else, print that it's greater, x is greater than y. So here we've got two variables and they're equal, so they do print that out. So the first branch executed in was true, so it printed that statement, skip the rest. Here we've got x equal to 12 and y equal to 11. So it does the first 
check. That's not the case, so it comes down to the else. It says, is x less than y? 11 or 12 less than 11? No. So it goes to the elf, else to print what? What should be printed from this? Well, x is 12. It's greater than y, which is 11. And let's test for our last condition. So we have x now equal to 10, y equal to 11, and we should get x is less than y. So print statement from this inner branch of the second if statement, the first condition of the second if statement prints out. Now, some people find nested ifs very confusing and prefer to use a series of else ifs but it's a personal choice, whichever you find easier to read. Our author of our textbook, Think Python, feels that they are more confusing and recommends you avoid them. Next, let's take a look at recursion. Is it legal for one function to call another? Well, yes, it is. And it's also legal for a function to call itself. So, that maybe it may not be obvious that that is a good thing, but it turns out it can be very helpful and can be very magical in some situations. So what is recursion in Python? Well, recursion is the process of defining something in terms of itself. So physical world example would be putting two to place two parallel mirrors facing each other. Seems kind of silly, huh? But let's try it here. We're going to create a function called countdown. So we're defining countdown to have one parameter in, and within countdown, what's gonna happen is it's going to do an if statement. If in is less than or equal to zero, print blast off. Else, print in, and then reset your countdown to n minus one. So if n is zero or negative, it's just gonna immediately go right into blast off. So let's go ahead and create this because we wanna try it out. Now let's pass countdown the variable five and see what happens. We get five, four, three, two, one, blast off. So what happens in this statement, because five is not less than or equal to zero, it does go down to the else and it prints the number, then it runs countdown again using the number minus one and it just keeps going until we get to n being zero and then it just immediately press, prints out blast off. So it's very useful and helpful in that occasion to use recursion. However, the risk is infinite recursion. When you are not careful and don't have a base case set up so that it will terminate, you can get into an infinite loop type of situation. And in most programming environments, a program with infinite recursion does not really run forever. In Python, that reports an error message that a maximum recursion depth has been reached. So here we have def defined a function called recursion that's just gonna call recursion. So if I start that and then we call that it's going to continue running and then develop a recursion error because it got in that loop and it just kept going around till it hit the maximum recursion depth and then it terminates. So when you see an error such as this, go back over your code because you probably haven't created a base case to cause the conditions to change and stop your loop. All right, the last thing we're going to talk about in this chapter is keyboard input. Now we've used keyboard input previously when we were asking a program to prompt a user for input. So here we have text being set to 
as a variable to request input. If I run it like this, it just prompts me to put something in, but it doesn't give me any information about what to put in. So if I just type in text, okay, that what seems to be acceptable in work, and it outputs text, which is what I entered. Now, it's better to ask for something useful. So here I've got a variable called number assigned to ask for input, and it's asking to pick a number between one and three. And it also is telling the computer to go to a new line. So if I run this, it prompts me asking me to pick a number between one and three. What happens if I pick two? Appears to work. So let's run this. Yes, it has two in it. What happens when I try to prompt it to turn my text to into an integer? It causes an error message because I typed it in as opposed to putting it in as a digit. So you need to be careful about that. Let's try this again. I'm going to put my two in as a number. That code works just like it did before. I get it here, but it's still putting it out as a string because I can tell because of the single quotation marks. However, now when I try to convert that to an integer, it does it just fine because it is a numeric text string. So now here it's a text string and down here it's a regular integer. So what if they typed out the digits instead? This is just what I got through demonstrating, but let me show it to you one more time. DWO. I get my error message. And there's what happens. If you have any questions, please consult your professor.